Committee on National Security of the Border and Foreign Affairs will come to order. Everyone welcome. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess at any time. I'm going to recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to the hearing before the Subcommittee on National Security of the Border and Foreign Affairs. Today's hearing is an examination of concerns of waste, fraud, and abuse and mismanagement of America's foreign aid. Something that the people back home love to hear about. I'd like to take a moment to thank our witnesses for being here today. It's my hope we can have a productive dialogue on the mechanisms needed to oversee how American taxpayer dollars are being spent on foreign aid. The World Bank, even the World Bank, estimates that 20% of foreign aid is lost to corruption each year and that 30% of foreign aid fails to reach its intended target. The committee has a long history of conducting oversight on how few guardrails are in place when it comes to vetting contractors and grantees, leaving foreign assistance vulnerable to exploitation and undermining U.S. strategic goals. Today, we'll examine whether, and if so, how the U.S. government ensures that taxpayer-funded foreign, foreign aid achieves its objectives while safeguarding those dollars from being diverted to unintended or unlawful purposes. We'll examine how USAID and Department of State monitor and evaluate their programs to make sure they're meeting their intended goals. Recently, USAID inspect the USAID Inspector General has cautioned that foreign aid is going to Gaza and the West Bank, or foreign aid going to Gaza and the West Bank, is at extremely high risk of waste, fraud, and abuse. In 2022 and 2023, the United States donated over $700 million to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, an organization created and intended to provide humanitarian relief for the Palestinians. What did we find out? We now know the Ham Hamas co compound was located under, UNRWA, under the, an UNRWA building in Gaza City. Further evidence surfaced that some UNRWA employees participated in the devastating October 7th Hamas attack against Israel on Israeli soil. Unfortunately, the Biden administration has been sending taxpayer dollars to UNRWA since 2021, despite concerns that funds were being diverted to support terrorist activities. That's why the previous administration had held funds from UNRWA. The Biden administration unwisely reversed this decision. And taxpayer dollars were released to UNRWA without adequate guardrails to ensure the funds went for humanitarian relief rather than the Hamas terrorists, and were only paused again after reports about UNRWA's support for terrorist activists, activists, activities surfaced a few weeks ago. That's why I let, I, request, I let a request with committee chairman Comer and other Republican members of this committee to Secretary Blinken requesting documents and information about the Biden administration's 2021 decision to restore funding to UNRWA. Understand this decision will hopefully help us better understand if, and if so, how the administration tracks foreign assistance in other places around the world. The committee's, oversight of <coughs> the committee's oversight of foreign assistance is critically important, not only to ensure taxpayer dollars aren't being well spent, but also to know whether the federal government is providing foreign assistance from falling into the hands of terrorists or other malicious actors. A recent poll by the Associated Press found <coughs> <coughs> found that four in 10 U.S. adults said foreign policy should be a top priority for the U.S. government. That's twice as many who mentioned the topic on the same survey conducted in 2022. This poll shows that increased anxiety of the American public, shows the increased anxiety the American public feel, feels when it comes on how the U.S. conducts itself on the world stage. Unfortunately, this administration made another reckless decision during his recent State of the Union speech, President Biden announced plans for the U.S. military to build a temporary port to deliver more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. The President decided uh, to maroon approximately 1,000 American uniformed men and women off the cost of Gaza to build, using taxpayers' dollars again, a supposed humanitarian aid port without providing assurances that Hamas will not attack our troops or those receiving the aid, or that Hamas will not divert that aid for its own evil purposes. 
Foreign aid to Gaza is not the only area of foreign assistance that requires scrutiny here today. The U.S. heavily relies on direct budget assistance to foreign governments. It's vital that Congress and the administration establish robust oversight mechanisms to prevent corruption and diversion of these funds. It always kind of amazes me. These countries always say they need funds, but they they seem to disappear. Any assistance to Ukraine must also be conditioned on the principle that they will allow full transparency, commit to tracking weapons and equipment, and open their books to the U.S. government. Additionally, most of the money going to the Ukraine flows to the World Bank or other public international organizations. We owe it to the American people to demand greater <coughs> greater accountability and transparency for multilateral organizations to ensure their operations align with our national interests and values. <coughs> Lastly, we cannot ignore the allegations of political abuse surrounding the Biden administration's use of foreign aid. The politicization of aid distribution, including the imposition of conditions based on ideological agendas, <coughs> including DEI goals and left-wing climate policies, threatens to undermine the credibility and effectiveness of our foreign assistance. Oversight of foreign assistance is not merely a matter of fiscal responsibility, but a reflection of strategic goals. <coughs> Today hearing represents, today's hearing represents an opportunity to identify shortcomings, proposed reforms, and ensure that USAID serves as a force of good in the world. I look forward to the insights and recommendations that will emerge from today's discussion and our esteemed witness panel. I'd now like to recognize the ranking member for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we obviously know that oversight of our federal budget is, is very important, and it's certainly important that, um, that part of that oversight is, is federal aid as well. Uh, foreign, uh, I'm sorry, foreign aid. Foreign aid we know is about 1% of the federal budget, um, comparable to defense spending, which you know is about 12% of the budget. That 1% makes an incredible impact across the world. Um, certainly, when, and not just obviously in some of the conflict zones that are where foreign aid oftentimes is really critical, um, but also in building our relationships with our allies, but also strengthening our position uh, across the globe. Uh, we know that um, as we speak, foreign aid is also critical in, uh, in some of our conflict zones. And unfortunately, uh, my friends, the majority right now are currently blocking about $60 billion of support to Ukraine in our fight against Russia. This is aid that is absolutely crucial to the help the Ukrainian people defend themselves. Ukrainians are fighting for their freedom and democracy against Vladimir Putin, a war criminal who has attacked America's democracy as well. And here are some facts. Our government has more than 400 people working to oversee foreign aid. The Inspector General from the Defense Department, State Department, the U.S. Agency for International Development, all work with 20 other federal agencies and the Ukrainian government. There is deep oversight with how we spend our support and our tax dollars from here at home. I also want to make sure that I ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record this list of more than 145 completed, ongoing, and planned oversight reports and investigations from the Special Inspector General for Operation Atlantic Resolve. Without objection. Thank you. The Ukrainians themselves are fighting for their existence. They want and need our aid to make the biggest possible impact as well. Now, Transparency International's 2023 report on international corruption reported that Ukraine has made significant progress taking on corruption even during the challenges of war. Now, wartime, wartime Ukraine climbed 12 places in the 2023 edition of this annual survey. Now, the report found, and I want to quote, that Ukraine's growth by three points is one of the best results over the past year in the entire world, end quote. Now, we know there are challenges, and certainly a lot of folks like to point, point out um, where, where there's areas that we can improve. And conducting oversight in a war zone is hard when we can't access, of course, the front line. But this foreign aid is critical, especially at this moment. Now, at the outset of the conflict, U.S. personnel in Ukraine had to be evacuated. We all know this. Over the course of the next six months, U.S. agencies worked diligently to establish logistic hubs in partner nations to oversee the transfer of aid and equipment. It's important to note that up until this conflict, end-use monitoring of defense articles had only been executed in a peacetime environment, which meant the U.S. government uh, could, not, could conduct site visits and have greater access. Now, our agencies conducting oversight of aid to Ukraine had to develop entirely new procedures for conducting this work in a hostile environment. 
Now, our, my friends in the majority like to, of course, also talk about issues around the border. And we, of course, haven't had a single hearing on push factors that drive people to migrate. But we know that foreign aid and additional foreign aid would also have a huge impact on what is happening along the border and certainly to help the people of Mexico, Central America, and South America. We should have a hearing that examines the root causes of our global problems and work to remediate those. Now, our humanitarian aid fights, we know that humanita our, our humanitarian aid fights displacement by addressing these root causes. Poverty and climate change, we know, are also huge factors. And when we look at migration that's happening, for example, in Guatemala or Honduras, there are huge challenges that could also be addressed with support from the United States and the world as it relates to human aid. The humanitarian crisis in Venezuela has been an enormous driver of folks coming to the border. We used to have thousands of folks from Venezuela come to the border, and now we've had, in some years, hundreds of thousands of folks from Venezuela coming to the border. We know that in countries where criminal gangs may control uh, the police or the government, our U.S. assistance is vital to also fight corruption and insecurity. In Guatemala, for instance, we funded a UN commission of independent prosecutors that helped prosecute, take on military death squads, take on rogue police officers, drug cartels, and even two presidents. That commission helped cut homicides, by the way, by 32%, dismantle 60 criminal networks, and catalyze the indictment of 680 bad actors across the country. President Biden has fought to strengthen that commission even when he was vice president. So there's a lot of work that we can do around human aid. I want to ask also for unanimous consent to introduce this report from the Washington Office of Latin America called When the Dominoes Fall, uh, 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 Corruption of the Justice System in Guatemala into the record. Without objection. Thank you. So just like in Ukraine, there are, there are attacks um, by some on foreign aid that has harmed innocent people, weakened American values, and harmed our national interests. Foreign aid is critical in our success as a country and in our national security interests as well. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to introduce our witnesses today. Uh, first of all, going across here, Jim Richardson, Executive Director to former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and Chairman of the Pompeo Foundation. Previously, he was the Director of the Office of Foreign Assistance at the Department of State and has decades in private and government service. Next, Max Pomorek, a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. Previously, he was the acting chief operating officer at USAID during the Trump administration. And finally, Charles Kinney, senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. Previously, worked for the World Bank, focusing on anti-corruption relating to infrastructure and natural resources. Again, I want to thank all three of you for being here today. Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that it's the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Good, we keep the record going. Uh, let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you, you may take a seat. We appreciate you being here and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statement, uh, and it will appear f in full in the hearing record. So if you can, try to limit your opening statement to about five minutes. As a reminder, please push the button on the microphone in front of you so that it is on and the members can hear you. When you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow. When the red light comes on, your five, five minutes are up, and wrap up as quickly as you can. I'll now recognize Mr. Richardson for your opening statement. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the committee. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to discuss how we can improve U.S. foreign assistance. As the Chairman said, my name is Jim Richardson, and it's a great honor to be back here in the House, having spent much of my career in Rayburn before heading to the executive branch during the Trump administration. My first stop was to reorganize the U.S. Agency for International Development, undertaking one of the largest reorganizations of the agency in history, we moved to a more data-informed and goal-oriented approach and worked to realign our structures, people, and systems to match. After USAID, I was the director of the Office of Foreign Assistance at the State Department. There, I coordinated assistance across USAID and state on behalf of the secretary. Needless to say, I've encountered lots of obstacles and a lot of potential in our uh, foreign aid. As we discuss how to improve it, I want to press three things. One, strategic alignment. Two, a renewed focus on effectiveness 
and number three, a careful selection of our partners and instruments to maximize the impact of our existence and ensure that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. First and foremost, we must see our foreign aid as a tool of our national security efforts and ensure complete alignment. We are seeing foreign aid be used to advance narrow political ideologies, as the chairman mentioned. This is both wasteful and dangerous. Our nation is facing real challenges, from China to drug cartels to terrorism to mass migration on our southern border. With limited resources, it's imperative that we carefully choose where and how to employ our foreign assistance to achieve our national security goals. Second, we have to demand maximum impact from our foreign assistance programs. Progress must be measured against specific, meaningful benchmarks that drive towards concrete outcomes. Whether facilitating self-reliance, promoting bilateral trade, or advancing strategic goals, our assistance must produce measurable results that actually matter to the American people. We must constantly reevaluate existing programs, stop ineffective ones, and embrace innovative ideas that suit the unique circumstances of each situation. This includes shifting towards more conditional assistance, partnerships, loans, and investments, and away from more traditional approaches that have often proven ineffective. Take Ukraine, for instance, a topic of conversation already here today. Here, economic development is, development is robust, and so instead of providing economic assistance grants, we should transition to more of a loan-based assistance. Loans can foster economic self-reliance and encourage responsible fiscal management. Finally, I want to touch on how we engage with those who implement our insistence. As you know, the United States utilizes a wide variety of nonprofits, for-profits, and international organizations to implement its programs. First, we need to reduce our reliance on public international organizations, PIOs, specifically the UN family. Working directly through the PIOs is inherently less transparent and less accountable. Instead, we should select partners who can best accomplish the task with maximum control and accountability. This is often a local partner, which is, has an added benefit of building the capacity of the host country. Once identified, rigorous vetting processes are essential to ensure the suitability and integrity of our partners. We must ensure that all partners, including PIOs, are subject to the same vetting standards. Given what happened in Gaza, as the chairman mentioned, it is essential that, that we, we vet our PIOs. If we have to use them, they have to be vetted, and that includes the NGOs that work with them uh, that, that the PIOs actually fund. Furthermore, we must vet partners beyond just ties to terrorism, which is our current standard. While terrorism remains a paramount concern, we want to make sure that American taxpayers remain at the hands of a wide range of bad actors, including drug, trafficker, drug traffickers and wildlife poachers. Foreign assistance is an incredibly complex topic, so I appreciate your willingness to hold this hearing and I look forward to your questions. He's a good Joe. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Primorak for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member and distinguished members of the subcommittee to speak about America's foreign aid apparatus. Again, my name is Max Primorak. I work at the Heritage Foundation. The views I expressed here at testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Chairman, I've spent over 30 years in the foreign aid uh, sphere as an NGO practitioner in the Balkans, as USAID contractor in Afghanistan, think tank expert, and also as a senior official at the U.S. Agency for International Development, as well as U.S. Department of State. I served as an envoy of the Vice President to carry out his counter-genocide programs in Iraq. It is, however, with great sadness that I must describe our foreign aid apparatus as broken and even corrupt. Foreign aid is a tool of foreign policy, as Jim has uh, mentioned. Its purpose is to promote the national interest of the United States. In the past, foreign aid helped curb the spread of communism. After the fall of communism, it helped integrate Central and Eastern Europe into NATO and become strong allies. Millions of lives have been saved by our global disaster responses. But the foreign aid budget has become too big. 
our federal agencies cannot fulfill their management and oversight functions. The result is substantial waste, fraud, and abuse. A well-financed and politicized aid industrial complex lobbies Congress for higher foreign aid budgets and against reforms to hold them accountable. Worse, foreign aid is misused to export radical ideas that offend many Americans, erode our talent base in our aid workforce, and trample on the religious beliefs in countries where we provide aid. This benefits communist China. So, what reforms are needed to restore the critical global role that U.S. foreign aid once played in advancing America's national interest? First, Congress must make deep cuts in the international affairs budget to a level our federal agencies can reasonably manage. When I launched the new Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and its $8 billion portfolio, I was impressed by the response capabilities of our workforce, but deeply troubled at the inability to track where this aid was going. Mr. Chairman, as you've mentioned, American taxpayers now know that millions of dollars of U.S. aid to Gaza was diverted to Hamas to finance a terror network that led to the October 7th massacres of over 1,000 Israeli citizens. Through aid diversion, we are also financing terrorists in Yemen, Syria, and Afghanistan. Years of humanitarian aid have destroyed the ability of countries to feed themselves. While on special assignment to Haiti, I asked local entrepreneurs why their farmers couldn't feed their country. Their dry response was that it is hard to compete against free food. Second, defunding the climate agenda will reduce global poverty and hunger. Foreign aid policy discourages countries, especially poor countries, from developing their fossil fuel industries to secure cheap energy, generate revenues to finance their own social services, and reduce the cost of food. Instead, we are forcing these countries to rely on communist China to meet their wind and solar equipment needs. Third, we need more transparency and accountability. Congress must require that all aid awards and subawards be made public. A recent government audit found that USAID did not know the overhead charges of almost $142 billion in awards. Procurement fraud by international organizations has become an endemic. Instead, we should increase funding to church-based local NGOs rather than expensive UN agencies and for-profit contractors. Fourth, we must de-radicalize our aid programs. We must stop pushing DEI, abortion, and other gender policies overseas, norms that contradict those in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Lastly, we must refocus our foreign aid approach towards partnership with America's private sector to increase trade and investment with the Global South. To do this, we must amend the BUILD Act to strengthen the U.S. International Development Corporation as a, as a tool, uh, as a counter-China tool, and expand the role of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which, refor which rewards economic reformers. To conclude, the objective of foreign aid must be to end the need for it. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Now, Mr. Kenny, your opening statement. Chairman Grothman, Ranking Member Garcia, uh, members of the subcommittee, thanks very much for inviting me today. Um, I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development, uh, but I'm speaking very much on my own behalf today. I've spent a number of years uh, researching corruption in foreign aid and aid effectiveness more generally, um, and in previous work for the World Bank, um, I managed aid programs, um, including some in fragile states. I want to make two points. Uh, first, corruption and financial mas mismanagement is a real problem globally with negative implications for both development and foreign assistance, but it does not stop that assistance having a major impact. Second, reducing upstream bureaucracy and focusing on impact through transparency and tracking results is the best way to deliver more effective aid. Every year, the global total of bribe payments may be as high as 2% of GDP. Beyond corruption, considerable government finance is wasted on projects that don't deliver what they promised due to factors ranging from incompetence to fraud. And US government spending, including US foreign assistance, is not immune from those problems. That said, US civilian aid 
is some of the most closely monitored of all government spending. And that monitoring suggests that while malfeasance does occur, it is comparatively rare on average. Let me provide some examples. Between 2012 and 2020, SIGAR, the Special, Investor Gen Gen Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, issued 176 audit reports covering 8.5 billion in costs for Afghanistan reconstruction, and only about 0.4% of the audited costs were eventually disallowed. Again, the Ukraine Special um, Inspector General report of February this year noted that USAID carried out spot checks that trace expenditures reported by the Ukrainian government to verify that direct budget support was received by intended beneficiaries. Of 475 spot checks, um, um, all were carried out with any major issues, without any major issues identified. Of course, special investigators, inspectors general and integrity departments don't and never will be able to audit every penny to the last recipient. Whatever the level of control, we will never be able to ensure zero waste or fraud. But what we can say is that leakage rates are usually low. And again, we can say it with more confidence about civilian foreign assistance flows than we can about a lot of other government finance. But take Afghanistan again. When assistance failed, and surely a lot of assistance failed in Afghanistan, not least, for example, when it came to helping the Afghan National Army become an effective fighting force. It was because of problems that don't appear in financial audit reports. Conversely, a lot of aid with somewhat inadequate paperwork managed to have a very meaningful and positive impact. For example, starting in 2002, USAID supported the Afghan Ministry of Health, delivering a basic package of, of healthcare services to 90% of the country at a cost of about $4.50 per person per year. USAID focused on results and used independent evaluations to ensure that the vaccinations happened and that services were provided. The results speak for themselves. The proportion of kids who died before their fifth birthday in Afghanistan fell from about 13% in 2001 to about 6% in 2020. That declining mortality rate is saving more kids each year in Afghanistan than the total number born in Nebraska, Nevada, and Kansas combined. And US assistance can take a big part of the credit. It is these results that matter that aid is saving lives and promoting economic growth. Getting these results is why we provide the assistance in the first place. And an excess focus on monitoring receipts and processes can get in the way of achieving that. Back in 2010, Andrew Natsios, a USAID, a USAID administrator under President George W. Bush, complained of the counter-bureaucracy of excessive process and control mechanisms fighting against aid effectiveness. Natsios suggested a third or more of USAID staff were hired purely to deal with compliance issues. And he asked, are we creating a system where every taxpayer dollar is accounted for that is incapable of carrying out its national security tasks? I think that question is even more urgent today. Congress has put in place some of the underpinnings for a results-based accountability agenda, including the Foreign Aid Transparency and Accountability Act. But I'd urge you to go further. Rather than an accountability model excessively based on processes and receipts, we should rebalance. We should be doing more to survey beneficiaries. We should be more to physically audit interest infrastructure financed under all aid projects. Where possible, rather than paying for potential outcomes, we should be basing payments on achieved results. Combined with transparency and project delivery targets that allow beneficiaries themselves to act as monitors, these approaches can ensure impact. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll now recognize myself for um, First of all, we'll start with Mr. Primerak. In the report you authored re released in May 2022 called Congress Must Stop Biden's Misuse of U.S. Foreign Aid to Impose His Radical Social Agenda, and by the way, part of the fault has to come from Congress who wanted him to do that, uh, U.S. foreign aid has become an appendage of one political party seeking to advance its radical global agenda of ideological indoctrination. That's what you said. Can you elaborate what you meant by that? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you for, for raising that issue. I think that uh, uh, Chairman uh, Mike McCall of the House Foreign Affairs Committee put it well when he learned, for example, that uh, the State Department was spending a massive amount of money, not only in the past but in the future, in strengthening its DEI structures within state. The same thing is over at uh, USAID, and he commented how DEI is enforced as enforced. Uh, now foreign aid and civil service officers much must pledge allegiance 
to the DEI agenda or else risk not being promoted. One of my colleagues, uh, formerly of the USAID, looked at FEC, uh, Federal uh, Election Commission uh, data regarding uh, political contributions. And at the State Department and at the USAID, you're talking about 97, 94% to one party. When you're looking at the top um, uh, uh, contractors for USAID, and you're talking about companies that are earning billions of dollars, again, you look at their FEC contributions, it's almost 100%, uh, 100% and on and on and on. What this has done has really harmed our, our workforce in which anybody who doesn't agree with this Marxist-inspired DEI uh, and other radical in, uh, uh, ideology is not welcomed. So you basically have a one-party uh, uh, aid uh, industrial complex, both in the in the bureaucracy, but also in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, aid community. I'll just read to you really quickly. For instance, uh, Interaction is uh, a coalition of uh, humanitarian aid organizations. Their DEI statement is that anti-blackness is rooted in white supremacy and refers to a white gaze, G-A-Z-E that places people of color against a model of whiteness. Uh, you have another uh, um, major coalition of, uh, of aid, uh, US aid uh, uh, contractors talking about uh, self-identity as black, indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, women, gender queer, non-binary, LGBTQIA+, people with disabilities, and those from formerly or currently colonized countries. Basically what this industry has told America that if you are conservative, if you're a Republican, if you're independent, you're a moderate Democrat, there's, which is the vast majority of America, there's no place for you to work in this industry. Thank you. Very, very illuminating. I, I personally believe the reason we couldn't get along with the people in Afghanistan is these State Department types were what most people around the world would be considered left-wing yeah. extremists. Um, next question, how can Congress prohibit, well, first of all, can you, I guess you gave me some. Can you give me any other examples of how the administration weaponizes foreign aid programs? Well, I can give you an example of one project that is uh, stunning. It's a $45 million five-year program to support uh, uh, global NGOs around the world and I remember reading about this project and looking at the request for uh, applications, looking at a footnote and mentioning that the, the inspiration for the theory working behind it was an Italian Marxist. And I looked at some of her, her work and uh, one of her panels that she led mentions, was titled, Marxism in Social Movements, Is Marx Back in Social Theory? We are literally financing a global network of anti-American, anti-capitalist, uh, anti-Western NGOs. It doesn't surprise me, but it's horrible. Mr. Richardson, a lot of members of this body are concerned about the amount of foreign assist assistance we are giving around the world when we have our own crisis at the southern border. Can you discuss how the U.S. should be monitoring the works of public international organizations involved at our southern border? How do we ensure these PIOs are not working against U.S. interests? And can you give me examples where you think they are? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I, yeah, I, I think the, the bottom line is that you have a lot of PIOs, a lot of the U.N. family organizations are providing billions of dollars in funding to NGOs to help migrants make the journey north. And um, there, obviously there's a lot of cash assistance, food support, but they are in, in, in encouraging, in a way, um, the migration from, from the South. Um, obviously that goes against, I think, what most Americans are looking for, which is a decrease. And in fact, it's, it's against what even the Biden administration is saying, that they don't want these migrants to come. And yet we're continuing to fund the PIOs that ultimately are doing this. Um, the, 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 the challenge, as I mentioned in my statement, the challenge with working with PIOs and the UN family in particular is <coughs> once you give the money, you almost lose all visibility and transparency and accountability. It goes into a big pot and then the, the, the UN folks get to decide how and where to use it. 
Furthermore, as I mentioned in my statement, we don't currently vet PIOs or the people that they work with. So the money just goes to the, to the UN organizations. We have no idea who these people are, who are ultimately getting these, these funds. We, we can't track it. We don't know if these organizations are, are attached to cartels or human smugglers. It'd be pretty smart if they were. Um, because obviously knowing the, the flow of resources and humans would be pretty interesting to human traffickers. But it's that type of, of challenge that we can't even solve because we don't have any visibility into what's happening. Thank you. We're paying for our own noose. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kenny, I'd like to talk about Ukraine a little bit. So, uh, look, I've been on this committee for over 20 years. Uh, the Oversight Committee's job is, is to oversee how that, how that money, that foreign aid gets spent. So uh, just myself, I have led over four, between 40 and 50 CODELs to Iraq, uh, probably did 20 trips to Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Somalia, Ukraine, uh, Syria, uh, Sudan. For the purpose of making sure that our money is going to the right places, and and I have to say, you know, Iraq was a mess. Uh, you know, we had a horror show there. We were handing out, you know, duffel bags full of cash that went God knows where. There was nine billion dollars that the Bush administration misspent in the the original surge to go in there. But uh, since then, you know, from my own observation, since then things have gotten much better. Uh, you know, the, the situation in Afghanistan, much, uh, much more uh, closely watched, much more uh, documented, and, and going forward to Ukraine, uh, I just want to point out that the $60 billion in the president's budget for Ukraine, 90% of that will be spent in the United States. So this is for munitions for Ukraine and to replace munitions that the United States has already given to Ukraine for their own defense. So we have, compared to the other uh, uh, foreign aid uh, packages that we've seen out there, this one has the most visibility because it's going to be spent, you know, by buying munitions from General Dynamics, uh, Raytheon, American companies staffed by American workers, that's where Ukraine is going to spend 90% of its money. Uh, the, other, the other piece of this is what's going on in Ukraine and with our oversight there. Uh, you know, we've got people on the ground. I was just there recently, uh, met with uh, uh, President Zelensky and his defense minister, talked about the need that we cannot have a bad story about USA to Ukraine. You need to make sure that every single dollar is tracked in terms of how it is spent. And, and he obviously brought up the point that he's spending it in the United States, uh, you know, 90% of it. So, uh, and we have a good set of oversight uh, uh, protocols here in the United States to make sure that that money is spent properly. Uh, you know, for 80 years, we've been preparing in this country. Our national security strategy has been to prepare our country to respond to an, a ground war in Europe. That's been our total, all those trillions of dollars over the last 80 years, we've been trying to prepare to respond to a, a ground war in Europe. Now we have one, and my Republican colleagues refuse to bring a bill up that would actually go towards defending the Europe and, and Ukraine. You know, the EU has already contributed more than the United States has towards Ukraine. You, the EU has contributed, and largely Germany and, and, and uh, the UK, uh, our British allies, have contributed $93 billion directly to, to Ukraine. Now, people will say, well, naturally, they're European countries and they're fearful for their own security. That's right. But, but they have been all in on this. And, and what Ukraine is asking for is the ability to defend itself. So can you talk a little bit in this last minute about what it means to U.S. national security and, and U.S. prestige in the world, U.S. leadership in the world, 
this refusal of the United States to step up and defend a democracy that is fighting its, for its life against a brutal, criminal, gangster dictator in, in Vladimir Putin. What does that mean? I'm an economist, not a, 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 a national uh, security expert, but I, I will say that um, I, I think the uh, U.S. leadership uh, in Ukraine really matters worldwide. It, um, it is of intense interest, as you say, to some of uh, the United States' closest allies. I'd also say that Ukraine is spending this money really effectively and well. It has one of the world's best systems for spending money, Prozoro. It's been universally uh, admired. So the combination of it being a really important place to spend money and a really effective place to spend money. Let me ask you, you know, according to the witness from the Heritage Foundation, the Trump administration justified uh, cuts uh, because they wanted to, quote, I'm quoting, avoid injecting divisive socio-political issues into its humanitarian, global health and development responses. Mr. Kenny, what is, what is divisive about funding global health programs that promote the safety and well-being of women and girls? Because that's, what, that's a lot of what I've seen overseas. You know, we, we, down in Sudan, we did an HIV clinic to stop the spread of HIV and AIDS uh, on, on the continent. What, what is divisive about that? Um, I, I, th I think all the panelists would agree that, that PEPFAR has, has been a, a massive uh, success um, and I, I think is a, a, a model for the world and, and shows incredible U.S. leadership. Um, I, I'd also say that uh, PEPFAR gets a bit less effective uh, when a whole load of the usual providers can't be used because as it happens, they also advise uh, on, on um, uh, sexual and reproductive health, um, and they're taken out of the picture. It actually makes PEPFAR's work more difficult. Frankly, it also leads to more abortions worldwide. We see when the global gag effect comes in uh, that uh, because the United States is such an important funder in this area, uh, countries get less in the way of uh, sexual and reproductive um, health services, including uh, uh, contraceptives. And the result is that the abortion rate goes up. Um, so I, I would love to see um, this not be quite the political football it is and, and turn into something where you know, you, the United States has shown such fantastic leadership on this. It's saving hundreds of thousands of lives in a really cheap and effective way. You know, anything that stands in the way of that seems to me a real shame. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I thank you for your courtesy. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Sessions. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And my dear friend uh, who has just spoken did politicize this activity. So I would ask each of you, what about the uh, inspector general who tried to find out about the uh, debacle that happened in Afghanistan was completely blocked from receiving information about what the United States spent their money doing, not just in the war, but in aid also. Do any of you have insight into that? Well, I'd be willing to speak about the, the aid piece since uh, the debacle. Uh, there was a recent uh, report from the Inspector General that mentioned that $3 billion worth of uh, cash disbursements in Afghanistan that they can't account for really where it went. Keep in mind, in order to have... So that, that kind of matches what the gentleman was talking about, all, these, uh, all this cash that disappeared under George Bush. So it's a rough business. Is that right? Well, the, the biggest... Uh, okay. The, um, the, the problem with Afghanistan is we don't have anybody on the ground. So there's just absolutely no one on the ground to see where the money is going or to be able to verify with partners. And there never was the going to be anybody there, and they gave yeah. the $3 billion anyway. They gave the $3 billion. Every year we've spent billions of dollars in Afghanistan, and as the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction has repeatedly explained to uh, members of Congress that he cannot guarantee that we're not financing the Taliban. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, um, by the way, thank you for being here, each of you. I think what our young chairman's doing is a very valuable hearing. I could not wait to get here. I'm sorry we were at votes. 
Uh, conversation from you, are, are any of you aware of Center for Immigration Studies? Ms. Richardson, talk to me about them. Uh, they're a, a non nonprofit think tank um, that focuses on lower migration numbers. Um, they state that they are pro-immigrant. Center for Immigration Studies uh, produced a paper January 24th. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, uh, unanimous consent to enter this into the record. Without objection. Uh, gentlemen, immigration, let's see, the Federalist.com. Anybody aware of them? Mr. Richardson? I'm not sure I'm following that one, sir. Okay. Uh, I do. I'll put myself in that category. I do. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent. United Nations guarantee uses U.S. grantee uses U.S. tax dollars to fund illegal immigration. I'd like to enter that into the record also. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, I know that there are lots of things always that we could disagree with. But one thing that living in Texas I cannot agree with is the way we have a political uh, philosophy by the Democratic Party that we're going to open up completely our borders without regard for national security, without regard for the law, without regard for common sense, and not only placing Americans in a difficult position, but using our money to get that done. Who is the largest uh, organization that we think, NGO, that we pay money to to encourage this sort of activity, at least in our southern border. Do any of you have any uh, heads up on that, Mr. Richardson? Well, the, the International Organization for Migration is, is one of the largest, um, again, a UN family organization. They're spending, I think it's $1.6 billion. They just stated they're, they're looking to uh, to raise money in order to, to fund a myriad of nonprofits. Um, as I said in my testimony, we have, we have no idea who these people really are. We, don't, I have, we can't dive deep into making sure that these are the right types of people we should be providing. But beyond that, they are encouraging migration. By, by making it illegal immigration, illegal immigration or migration. They, they, are, they, are, they are encouraging uh, illegal mi immigration into the United States. By, by funding and making it easier for people to, to make their way north. And that's a, it's, it's, it's all, I, I, it, is, it is so apparent to me that it's, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a question of, of, of whether that's true or not. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for having this hearing today, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I just think that, that this is all courtesy of the Democratic Party, and we should understand that elections have consequences. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Ms. Porter. On October 7th, 2023, Israel endured a devastating terrorist attack by Hamas. I support Israel's right to defend itself against terrorism. And I would say the same for any other country. That's because Israel should be treated like any other country. That is what Israel tells Congress, and I fully support that. As we consider aid to our allies, Congress should hear every country out. Israel should be treated like any other country. And that is why I signed the discharge petition for President Biden's aid package, so that we can have that debate about appropriate aid on the House floor. And when we do give foreign aid out, we verify that our allies are following the rules. The Leahy laws are supposed to verify that every country is meeting the same human rights standards. Under these laws, again, Israel should be treated like any other country. But is it? Is the vetting process really the same for all countries? Let's pull back the curtain. Mr. Richardson, does the United States vet each unit of a country's military individually before they receive security assistance? Uh, our, our vetting process is, is focused on non-U.S. based NGOs 
And so it does not include PIOs and generally does not include foreign militaries in the way, the, the way that we do partner vetting in sort of a, a foreign assistance way. But do you vet at the individual? Does the Leahy law generally require individual unit level vetting? I am not aware of, of the, the military vetting on an individual unit basis. No. Well, you were in charge of about 30%. You were in charge of foreign assistance at the Department of State, and the budget for security assistance was about 30% of your total budget. So yes, let, me, let me help you out on how it's supposed to work. Um, we are supposed to do unit-level vetting to make sure that each military unit that gets assistance is not violating the law. And that is the way it works, except... Whiteboard's big, except for 15 countries. 15 countries. 15 countries that include um, a whole number of, of other countries. Um, and I'm happy to read them off, but there's a, a long list of them. 15 countries. So I'm curious if other countries are getting special treatment. Let's say there's potential um, evidence that a unit of a country's armed forces has committed a human rights violation. Um, and there are exceptions for these different processes. So um, the special processes call into question if a single objection is enough to stop aid. Is that true? If there's a single, if, if, if there's a single objection that there is a human rights violation, does that stop aid? So when when a con when there is an accusation of. Um, abuse or misuse of U.S. resources uh, in, in the security space or in the, in, in the development space for that matter, you do have the ability to, to raise that and that gets vetted throughout a, a multiple processes. Right, that's how it works, except for who? Except for what countries? Do you know? I'm sorry, I don't, ma'am. Except for Israel, Ukraine, and Egypt, except for those countries. Generally, units would stop receiving assistance immediately, but there's um, that important concern. So when does aid stop immediately? State Department says that aid should stop immediately if there's a problem, does it? It totally depends on the circumstances and situation. Does it depend on the country that's getting the aid? It also depends on the country get, receiving the aid, yes. So what country does aid not stop immediately under Leahy? I'd have to go back and look through my notes. You, you don't know what country that is? It's only one in the entire world. Guess what? Except for Israel. So look, Congress has been told time and time and time again that the Leahy laws apply to everyone, to every country. And on paper, they do. But when we pull back the curtain, when we do some oversight, not all countries are being treated equally when the Leahy law is being implemented, especially our ally, Israel. Look, if Israel wants to be treated equally, which I'm for, then let's do it. Let's see the Israel Leahy Vetting Forum standard operating procedure so that we can see exactly how it works, how it is different from other countries, and what would the Department of State would need to change to treat Israel equally. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fallon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do not have a marker board, so. Um, I feel bad for you. Uh, well, uh, I'll just leave it there. This is my concern, that the, uh, we live in a very small world now, and foreign aid, I think, is critical. Not all of my colleagues agree with that, but I've seen, uh, being an amateur student of history, what happened after World War I. We got, became very isolationist. We got these big two moats, the Atlantic and the Pacific. We feel very safe, and all we got was a worse war 20 years later. So I don't want that to happen again, but we also have a geopolitical competitor that has four and a half times the population that we have nearly the same GDP uh, in China, and it's very worrisome. So we need to take heed of what China's doing with their Belt and Road Initiative and make sure that we administer our foreign aid very, very well, very precisely, and also here domestically acknowledge that we have a spending problem. We have a debt problem. 
We have a deficit problem on a yearly basis. And one of the first things that's going to go when that problem becomes too large to ignore and we hit austerity is foreign aid. And then China is going to rule the roost around the world. So it's a very, all these issues are interrelated. And then another concern I have is this foreign aid that is, I, I feel, very critical. I don't want to see it weaponized. And I think this administration, unfortunately, has done that uh, with, with taking these concepts that aren't even uh, aren't largely agreed upon in this country. Uh, and certainly on different cultures find some of this stuff very alarming uh, when you're talking about promoting abortion and gender uh, identity ideology and sometimes the climate. Uh, I, I'm not saying we, obviously we need to be concerned about uh, the climate and, uh, but not climate alarmism. We have to live within the bounds of reality. And this leftist shift in the foreign aid direction uh, is very troubling to me. I think it needs to be more uh, about promoting and projecting U.S. security and our prosperity and our democratic values and not spreading ideologies that are truly fringe concepts, not only in this country, but particularly in other countries that have uh, different cultures. So another very uh, alarming issue to me, and I served with, uh, I went on a, a CODEL with Chairman Lynch to Eastern Europe and Ukraine, was I don't want to see enough, because if enough Ukrainian aid falls into the wrong hands, particularly any kind of lethal aid, they're going to lose the war because we're going to demand on both sides of the aisle that uh, we don't give them any weaponry anymore. And then Kiev's going to fall. Putin's going to win. I do not want to see that. And what I wanted to ask the witnesses, and thank you all so much for being here today, is do you feel that the Biden administration has, uh, has been done, done a good job in conducting the oversight of this aid? Mr. Kennedy, you can go first. And just kind of a quick yes or no or and maybe a couple sentences. I can't speak to the military aid on the economic aid side, yes. You think it is? Okay. I say across the board, I would say no, unfortunately. No. Mr. Richardson? No. And that's the thing. I, I'm looking. I'm rooting for Ukraine, and I, I want them to get the aid that they need, and not necessarily. I think it's an extreme position to do what this administration has done with giving basically an open checkbook. At the same time, I think it's an extreme position to do absolutely nothing and let Putin win. So, again, we need to th thread a needle there. This is what's concerning to me. On the 11th of January this year, the Inspector General um, of the DOD released a report evaluating the DOD's oversight of defense articles provided to Ukraine. In the report, uh, the DOD IG determined that uh, in, as of June of 2023, and this is a quote, the serial number of inventories for more than a little over a billion dollars, 59% of the total that they checked, which was 1.7 billion, of the uh, EEUM designated defense articles were delinquent. That quote is directly from a DOD's very own press release. I mean, that's 59%. And then the IG went on to say, IG Scorch, I'm sorry, Scorch said, uh, persistent gaps uh, as identified in our evaluations may correlate with an inability to maintain complete accountability for this critical U.S. security assistance. So knowing that, uh, do you believe that this is a smart investment? Richard, you can uh, start. Uh, at the end of the day, we can't allow Putin to dominate Ukraine or invade Eastern Europe. And so I think you do have to thread that needle. I think there are ways to to have greater control. Just cutting out more of the U.N. organizations is certainly a good step. I would advocate for more loans versus um, uh, direct assistance, having more control over uh, our, our military uh, uh, sales, all good, all good ways. But I think you can do it. I think we have to do it. We have to find a way. I would say that in order to be effective, you need to have a strategy. What is the strategy of the administration? I'm not clear. When you're having uh, uh, programs in foreign aid, you need to have an outcome-based approach towards it. Otherwise, they become long-term entitlement programs that actually can do more harm, more harm than good. Mr. Kenny? Again, on, on the economic side, I, I think that uh, the spot checks that USAID are doing are the right approach, and there may be there could be more of them, right? Uh, most of the economic support is going through the World Bank that I think has quite good systems uh, in place. Uh, and then on to pay, largely pay salaries. There's a very easy way to check if that money's got where it's meant to go. You ask people, did you get paid? And I think USAID is doing some of that. It could do more, um, and, and that would be a, a great solution. But I think, you know, so far from the evidence we have, the money is getting where it's meant to on the, on, on the civilian side. And Mr. Chairman, just as a final note, I, th I do think that, I mean, Ukraine is the f has the fourth most natural resources of any nation in the world. 
uh, loans are something that's very intriguing because it does help them defeat Putin at the same time the American taxpayer can get their money back on a true investment. And they will not have the means to repay now, maybe not in five years, but they will eventually. Uh, because when this war is over, I do think they're going to be a successful economy. The 30 years into a 50-year journey, typically, if you look at North, I'm sorry, South Korea and Taiwan as a model of going from authoritarian to a functioning democracy, they're not there yet. They were getting there. Putin st stood in their way. But I think eventually that may be a solution that saves the day. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. We have a quick request from Ms. Porter. I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record an article from the Guttmacher Institute titled The Unprecedented Expansion of the Global Gag Rule, Trampling Rights, Health, and Free Speech. Sword. Thank and you. also I ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record this article from the New York Times stating that the United States does not have any evidence to suggest that aid had been, has been diverted or stolen. Okay, thank you. We'll order that to Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Richardson, maybe this has come to you. A few months ago, the Department of Defense Inspector General reported that the DOD had failed to work with the Ukrainians on tracking weapons and equipment going to Ukraine, and that the DOD IG reported that nearly 60 percent, that's a lot, 60 percent of advanced weapons and equipment remain unaccounted for. Now, Ukrainians are fighting a war, right? They're fighting for their lives. And I don't know if we're collecting dunnage. I don't know if we're collecting brass to know how many rounds were fired. I, I don't know how they're accounting for this equipment. It says equip weapons and equipment, advanced weapons and equipment. You can understand expendables like rounds. You can understand potentially weapons being destroyed, especially small arms. You start getting into artillery pieces, tracked vehicles, it happens, but they should be able to be accounted for, right? There's ways of doing that even from far away. Are, are we relying on the Ukrainians to account for these weapons? Or, or, or I mean, I imagine they can assist us, but, but we're, you know, we're going to be asked, we're continually asked. We've been asked for half a year now to provide more money to Ukraine. Sixty percent unaccounted for. It's hard. Look, it's hard to go back to your constituents who get up in the morning, pack a lunch, and head off to work to earn money to pay their bills, which they can't afford right now. And then this administration, the Biden administration, says, well, we need $65 billion to send to Ukraine. And our people, our people are saying 60% of it, we well, don't know where in the hell it is. What's going on? I can't speak to this, the specifics of what's exactly happening in Ukraine. Uh, this has all happened after I have left uh, the administration. But I will say that there is a small contingent in Kyiv at the embassy that will be responsible for tracking of equipment. It, it clearly is in, completely insufficient, and as well as the, as the processes that you would need to put in place in order to have appropriate tracking. Um, these are mostly DOD uh, personnel that would be responsible. Um, it's very hard to get outside of, of Kyiv, uh, assuming you've been there. It, it's hard to get to the front and to, or to do those types of tracking. But that's true across the spectrum. And also on the, the development side or the economic side, you, we do not have people, Americans or people that we trust, that can go and verify because they are mostly kept uh, captured in Kyiv and been unable to get out and see what is actually happening. So the, the system that you described, is this something new or is this a system that currently exists or at least existed during this audit, this report, these findings? Uh, so in Ukraine, it, this would have been based upon, you know, ever since Putin launched his second attack during the Biden administration, this would have been unique to this circumstance. But I would say there's the challenge with foreign aid, the, the way you get to the most corruption, most waste of fraud and abuse is when you operate in non-permissive environments like, F, like, like Gaza, like Afghanistan, like Ukraine, where you can't get out and sort of do the monitoring and evaluation that is required in order to provide confidence into the system. I mean, I got to tell you, your, your answer that, you know, this is kind of the way it is, it's, and it's not just this way with weapon systems, it's this way with economic aid. and It's a real and, problem. And the other pro you know, it doesn't engender a lot of confidence that I should spend 
six cents or six dollars or sixty dollars, let alone let alone sixty-five billion dollars of of the people that I represent, my bosses, they're out there working their tails off and can't afford their electricity bills, can't afford their grocery bills, can't afford, you know, a new a mortgage on a new home. It's it's and you're not selling me right now. You're, I hate to tell you, you're not selling me. I mean, we got technology. I bet if I bet if we told Amazon or MasterCard to track every single one of these things, whether it was a dollar, a penny, or a one five five round, I suspect they would track it as long as they were getting paid. And somehow the federal government can't find its rear end with both hands, but they sure have a way of coming in and telling all the folks in this committee and across Congress, we got to send billions and billions of more dollars to Ukraine. I, I. 100% agree that we have to have more command and control and more monitoring and evaluation of foreign assistance. And I, I, I go back to the loan, the loan idea as well that President Trump has floated. I think you have to have more skin in the game, <coughs> more ownership by the Ukrainians, more responsibility from the EU. This is, this is ultimately going to impact them the most. You know, the, the, this, did not, this problem did not start you know, two years ago, this problem started because NATO failed to meet its 2% obligation. This is why we have to, it's a very much a whole approach that we have to bring back responsibility and accountability into yeah. the system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I we're glad we have Mr. Perry on this committee. Oh, we're going on to Mr. LeTurner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today as we discuss our nation's foreign assistance programs. Foreign aid is not merely an act of goodwill. It's a strategic investment in global stability, security, and prosperity. It enhances our diplomatic relations, expands free markets, and promotes human humanitarian values, all while being cheaper and safer than war. The money the U.S. spends on foreign aid around the world is a worthwhile investment when it does what it's intended to do. In, the 2023, in 2023 alone, the U.S. spent $52 billion in foreign assistance to over 200 countries and regions. As members of this committee, we owe it to our constituents to ensure these funds are used responsibly, transparently, and effectively to achieve their intended goals. Under the Biden administration, this has not been the case. One of President Biden's first actions was to reverse a decision made under the Trump administration and restore funding to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, despite mounting evidence tying the organization to Iran-backed Hamas terrorists. It's now being reported that at least a dozen UNRWA employees willingly participated in the murder, rape, and kidnapping of innocent Israelis on October 7th. Further, since President Biden's botched withdrawal from Afghanistan, the U.S. has provided $11.3 billion in foreign aid to the region. This past August, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, John Sopko, testified before this committee. In his testimony, he stated, quote, it is clear from our work that the Taliban is using various methods to divert USA dollars, end quote. Not only did President Biden and his administration leave behind billions of dollars in military equipment to the Taliban, but now our tax dollars are helping fund their ruthless operations. The Biden administration has also weaponized US foreign aid to force their liberal agenda on the rest of the world, pushing taxpayer-funded abortion, climate alarmism, and DEI initiatives. The status quo from President Biden is unacceptable and unsustainable. We need to uphold our commitment to our allies while cutting wasteful and ineffective spending to better protect America's hard-earned tax dollars. I look forward to hearing from, uh, from our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Richardson, it's clear that our foreign aid efforts involved a, a multitude of offices, agencies spanning the government. I want to talk about the coordination happening across these entities. Currently, there are over 20 U.S. government agencies engaged in our foreign assistance efforts. What can we do to ensure that our efforts among these agencies are strategically aligned and coordinated to maximize the impact and efficiency? Yeah, I, thank you for that, that, that statement and, and for the question. Uh, as you mentioned, over, there's over 20 federal, um, federal government agencies responsible for, for foreign assistance. So we talk about USAID, state, MCC, DFC, but we've got, we've got uh, Treasury out there, Commerce, uh, Agriculture, Justice Department, DHS. They're all sort of operating in a complete stove type uh, manner. And it's supposed to be 
uh, coordinated at the post. So it's supposed to be coordinated by the ambassador at a particular mission. The, the, the problem is it doesn't happen that way. And ultimately, the ambassador has lots of things they're focused on, and, but, and, and, and God bless them, they're having, doing a hard work, but the funding decisions about what types of programs are going to these posts are happening here in Washington. So you really need to centralize it, have a director of foreign assistance who's actually accountable, can bring all the, uh, the foreign assistance uh, agencies together, be very clear about what we're trying to accomplish, be, be clear that this is aligned to our national security goals, as you mentioned. How do we counter China? How do we bolster trade? How do we create prosperity here in America? And then making sure that all the, the federal, whole federal government is working together to achieve that. I appreciate the answer and look forward to talking to you more offline about this. Let's switch gears real quick. President Trump has floated the idea of loaning money in Ukraine. Can you elaborate on why loan-based and conditional assistance can be useful in certain circumstances? Yeah, absolutely. I, I really think this is a larger question, not just of loans in, in Ukraine, but we really have an opportunity to re examine how we give assistance more broadly. We have been so accustomed to writing a check to, to the UN or to an NGO or to a for-profit company and just that, that's just the way it always works. We really need to think about conditional assistance, holding countries accountable, um, uh, doing more investments. When it comes to loans, you have an opportunity to make sure that Ukraine has more skin in the game, has, it brings in more accountability, it, it drives the, the Ukrainians to actually care more about these dollars than they would today. And that's really what you want. And as, as, as your colleague mentioned, Ukraine is going to succeed if, if they can win this war and they can keep Russia out of their backyard. That they really have an opportunity to be very prosperous. That's great. We should, we should encourage that. We should want that. And then the American people should be paid back for every dollar that they spent in Ukraine. Mr. Primarek, I have a, a whole host of questions for you, but I've run out of time, so I'll be submitting those. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meggs. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. I apologize. I'm in a markup next door and have been there a uh, better part of the day. So um, I want to talk about something slightly different, perhaps. It's been well documented that non-governmental organizations are down at the southern border in my home state of Arizona and other border states, and including south of the border, helping to facilitate and escalate the Biden border crisis. DHS uh, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was a board member at one of those NGOs, HIAS, an organization which in FY22 received nearly 50% of, of its revenues from grants uh, from governmental agencies, including the State Department and Department of Homeland Security. HIAS publicly congratulated Secretary Mayorkas for his appointment, specifically noting that he was a primary architect of the DACA program. In turn, with this web of coordination between the Biden administration, the NGOs, and the cartels, it encourages more unchecked and unfettered illegal immigration, all at the expense of the American people. So Mr. Richardson, please explain to me how these NGOs are coordinating with Secretary Mayorkas and the Biden administration to continue with this illegal mass migration. Yeah, you bet. Uh, the coordination is happening in two ways. Uh, the, the United States government, mostly through the State Department, but other avenues as well, will fund IOM, the International Organization of Migration. They, in turn, have a network of NGOs that they directly fund. And then, so the, these NGOs are getting funding directly from the State Department, USAID, Homeland Security, 20 other government agencies, most likely. Probably no one knows who's getting multiple US government grants all at the same time. And then they're also being received funding from the UN. Um, obviously, the, the problem is that these organizations are encouraging and abetting illegal immigration into our country, uh, which is, the Biden administration keeps saying that it's opposed to doing it and yet continues to support uh, organizations that are doing just that. And FEMA also uh, helps provide the uh, dollars as well. Another NGO, Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services, reported more than $93 million in U.S. government grants in its 2021 financial statement meaning that taxpayer-funded grants accounted for more than 80% of its total support. Additionally, a DHS-OIG report found that 18 different NGOs receiving a total of $66 million in funding did not always comply with funding and application guidance. Are there any accountability measures in place for NGOs 
who misuse taxpayer funds to prevent them from receiving future dollars, or is Congress and the Biden administration going to continue to fund this illegal mass migration operation? And I think we all know the answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, like at the end of the day, the Biden administration seems seems committed to funding these NGOs. Uh, if if there is documented problems, there are processes in order to sort of blacklist an NGO. But th these these NGOs are doing exactly what the Biden administration wants, which is to provide uh, comfort and support for illegal immigration uh, across our southern border. Well, it, yes, it's an organized, well-oiled machine working to carrying out this mass migration. Um, Mr. Primorak, is that how you say it? Uh, what are these NGOs specifically doing to help illegal migrants once they cross into the U.S. or even as they travel up to the United States? Congress, what I'd like to do to answer that question is to start in Central America, specifically where the, the root causes strategy in which we're spending billion, you know, billions of dollars in order to prevent them to coming up in the first place. But when you start looking at what the programs are, for instance, it's a $50 million regional center to promote gender equity. There's one to promote intersex legal reforms. These are the kind of projects that we're pushing. And second, no matter how much that we're going to spend in foreign aid in, in Central America or other places, when you look at the remittances that go back to Central America, you're talking a fact that tens of billions of dollars, so a factor of 20, 30, or 40 times more than the foreign aid that we're providing these countries. So it doesn't work. It's simply a waste of money. You need a strong border. That's what's going to prevent them from coming into the United States. But there's no incentive for these countries to reform economically as long as they see billions and billions of money of dollars coming in from remittances, whether they're legal or illegal uh, uh, immigrants. And I would say tacitly that that in indicates that there is if not direct coordination, there's certainly complicity with the cartels who are managing our southern border. And that's, that's a critical uh, component to, the, to why we shouldn't be doing this. Mr. Uh, thank you for, for uh, t entertaining my questions. And Mr. Chairman, I have uh, some UC requests. Okay. I would like to introduce uh, into the record uh, three different articles. One, NGOs use American tax dollars to relocate migrants. Uh, one called Biden administration sends millions to religious nonprofits facilitating mass illegal migration. The third one by actually one of our witnesses today is foreign aid can't stem illegal immigration, the case of Guatemala. So ordered. Thank you. Yield back. Okay. I, I'm just going to give myself three more minutes and then I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, it, it was a very interesting hearing and uh, uh, but, but we'll give a question, I, I guess, to you, Mr. Richardson. Over the years, there have been several witnesses before this committee and subcommittee emphasizing the need to monitor and evaluate the contractors and grantees. Mm -hmm. The Special Inspector for Afghanistan Reconstruction told us instances where the contractors with questionable backgrounds still were getting lucrative contracts and were later found to have engaged in corrupt, corrupt uh, practices or even supported insurgent groups. Like Afghanistan, the USAID Inspector General testified in 2019 before the Appropriate Committee of the USAID. Their limitations in mitigating implementer risks have contributed to corrupt schemes across Iraq, Syria, and Africa. Can you tell us what tools we can use uh, for USAID and the State Department to vet these contractors and grantees better? Yeah. I so there is a very limited vetting program for partners that's focused exclusively on terrorism and only in a certain number of countries, uh, all in the Middle East. Um, I would strongly argue that we really have to expand the vetting process, make sure that everyone that receives U.S. taxpayer dollars, we know who they are, but not just not just the main contract, right? So we'll, we'll submit a contract for $50 billion for, with, a, with an organization. They will then in turn give 50% of that to other folks. We need to know who those other folks are. We need to know who's actually implementing assistance on the ground and be able to track who these people are, how they are, are they bad actors, not just related to terrorism but cartels, human traffickers, uh, poachers, there's, there's a whole host of folks who want to be inside our system, who could manipulate our system. The, the other thing I would, I would say is when we talk about monitoring and evaluation, we really want to, we, what 
what the development people are really telling you is that if I purchase an apple, you give me an apple. And that means we have success. Well, what's the goal? What are we trying to accomplish in, in, in that country, in that region, globally? And how does that apple add up to anything? We don't track that. That is the big missing middle in terms of our strategies. These countries, our, our, our host countries, our ambassadors, our teams, will create lofty goals about what we are trying to do, and then every one of these little programs will do monitoring evaluation that just proves that they are accomplishing something, but they're not actually proving that they're accomplishing a larger objective. And that's, that for the next stage of monitoring evaluation, I, I really encourage the Congress to, to pass legislation to really force the administration to align projects to actually strategic goals. We'll see if we can do something statutorily. Uh, I guess that's it. Wish we had another half an hour, um, but we're not going to. Uh, okay. In closing, I want to thank our witnesses once again for their testimony. I yield to uh, Ranking Member Lynch, I guess, for the second here. Do you want to do any closing remarks? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. I'll recognize myself uh, uh, with that and without a, or let me see, do I have a, no. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I think we've covered so many different uh, areas. Uh, we have the, uh, we're weighing in on social issues uh, that I wish we could spend more time on that on countries abroad where we're just attacking their religion and trying to drive their children away from what would be traditional values, even traditional values in this country. We're wasting money right and left. Where we have, we're spending money, uh, say in the Middle East, uh, to undermine our ally Israel. In this country, we're spending money to encourage more people to come across the line. I mean, there, there, there's almost nowhere I've seen since in Congress that we have money spent more, not only frivolously, against our own interests. And uh, I think we're going to do some follow-up questions here eventually. But either way, I wish I wish all of you luck in uh, trying to get the uh, whole foreign aid establishment back on the straight and narrow. Uh, so, with that and without objection, all members have five legislative days within to within which to submit materials and additional written questions, which will be forwarded to the witnesses. If there are no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.